Hey everyone, we'll call this meeting to order, and if everyone would join me with the pledge to the flag. Pledge to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> All right, well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, and welcome, welcome. Um, I see no uh, less than a shot is an excuse. She unfortunately could not make it. I uh, had a kind of a last minute um, issue. So, uh, she gave me a couple of things I want to bring up, so I'll bring that up a little later in, in the conversation. So uh, let's start with the approval of minutes. Can I get a motion to review the minutes, please? No move. Oh, thank you. I have a second. I'll second it. Second. Thank you. Thank you. All uh, right, any concerns, issues, additions to the minutes? No, I'll look for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Be curious. Let's go on to a resolution. We just have the one for the day today. Uh, authorize the county of Sioux to designate a Section 3 coordinator, clerk, housing officer, and establish revenue and expenditures to account for grant funding associated with our CDBG grants and CARES Act funding. So this is an annual um, designation that we do every single year, date correct, for these programs, and this is just that process. Um, it's specific to CDBG. Uh, community Development Block Grant Program, they often ask for a specific person's name that's identified with tasks associated with administering the program. So they, they're given us funds, but they require a certain um, but like a yes. authority structure, and this is how we designate those. Who's going to oversee these, these specific uh, requirements? Sure. And I think everyone at least remembers some of these grants we've already talked about uh, that the office has either applied for or has been awarded. So. We look forward to seeing those dispersed and all the benefit that comes from that. So I uh, look for a motion for EP1. I'll make a motion. All right, I've got that. And then a second from Roy. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, any discussion? Uh, Dave, anything else you want to add to that? No. Yeah, no? everything good? Okay. So it's just fully federally funded, right? Um, so the, the community development block grant funds. So yeah. Like some there, there might be, a, is there a local share on a couple of them? I'm no, I mean, um, this, and we also get add in uh, on these CDBG grants as well. So. Yeah, none of this time is fiscal impact. Yeah, nothing up this resolution. But yeah, no effect of this resolution. We're just naming people. All right. Yep. All there. I agree. I any opposed? All right. Great. Let's jump right. We got a bid discussion here. Um, so this is for the pilot project called the Ac Access Oswego Demand Response Transportation Service. Um, so I thank Holly for being here. I appreciate you. Uh, is there anything, Holly, you want to mention on this one as we kick it off? No. Well, just because Mel asked me a question. So you'll notice that the price is listed on the bid report, but we attached a schedule showing um, four years out. It's only for one year, but they submitted four years. So we just gave you extra information. But the contract is only for one year. Yeah. Okay. Is the expectation that it would bid again in one year from now, or would there be an extension? Or if, yeah, if we wrote the contract with an extension, should there be available funding or whatever, okay. that that would be the price. Understood. Okay. Um, Marilyn, do you have any? Yeah, that was just my concern because it was a pilot. I didn't see why we would have a contract for four years, understood. but understood she answered it, so thank you. Great. Uh, it was, again, a direct solicitation <coughs> of six additional, six total vendors, only one of which uh, put forward a uh, proposal. So, uh, Roy, do you have any questions on that one? No, sir. All right, excellent. Well, uh, if no additional questions, I'll look for a uh, vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. Move that forward then. Uh, next on the agenda here is the ARPA projects. Um, there are four of them. Uh, so, I will actually kick this over to Dave, if that's all right with you, Dave, and kind of give us a quick overview of each. And do we vote on these separately or we vote? Uh, in the past, you've uh, voted down them separately. Okay, excellent. And then we put it together as a packet for government yeah. who reduce it all as one. Well. Understood. Right. You want to start with the first one there, Dave? I've got the uh, Flaskay Farmer's Market. Sure. Um, this was a request um, pretty detailed to demonstrate what they do at their farmer's market, all the expenses they have, and uh, the impact that COVID had on their ability to raise funds to be able to continue to provide uh, this uh, venue, and they asked for uh, five thousand, and of course we did our uh, 
research uh, through the documents they provide that they actually only qualified for uh, $3,006, which is what the task force suggested was reasonable. And then, uh, just a reminder to those of the group, uh, the process is an application through the Strategic Initiatives Office. It's reviewed, underwritten, questions are asked. Uh, application is kind of uh, put together in a way that would answer any of the questions we should have. It's then uh, provided to the public task force discussion, uh, which the appointed membership from the chair of the legislature will review, uh, make sure it is eligible for funding. Um, and that's where you see things where a reduction from that task force suggestion uh, it, based on either past practice and precedent uh, or federal requirements from the law. So uh, the recommendations that come forward come from the task force, but again, it is this board's responsibility uh, to set the actual amounts um, or to, uh, to approve or uh, decline any of these projects. To go to government and courts as a, a final check, uh, actually not final, then to finance and personnel, and then to the floor for full vote. So there's about four bites of the apple, um, but I just wanted to see, uh, make sure that was um, Everybody remember the process. So, with that in mind, um, I'll look for—I guess let me look for a um, a motion to, to improve, to move this one forward. So, do I have a motion? Well, thank you. Do I have a second? Paul, second. She said the second. Oh, second. Move it. okay, perfect. Roy, Roy, Roy moved it, and no, I'll second it. Thank you. All right. Any discussion then, or questions about the Plaskai Farmers Market? Well, just that um, the farmers markets took a, a, a big hit during COVID. Um, I noticed, um, particularly class guys, because that's where I live, was made somewhat of a comeback this year, but it was still sparsely um, attended by vendors. Um, so hopefully that will continue to grow with the transportation that we've got to help uh, that out. But, uh, no, this money I'm sure will be well, well used. Yeah, that's great. And that's a good point. I think it's something that I don't know if this board is, is the appropriate board to discuss. But maybe we put it on the agenda for the future. Is you know, uh, I know the Swego Fulton. I think there's what's the, there's a fourth one, right? What's the what's the other one? Fulton 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 guy. guy, and then I thought there was another. I think there's one more. Central Square. Central Square. Central Square. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we could also discuss. I mean, I know it would be through the Human Services Committee. There's there's funds made available uh, yeah. for folks to uh, get vouchers to be used at those. Uh, we've worked on putting together transportation to get people to them. Uh, yeah. But you're right, and I noticed in the Oswego one specifically that um, the vendors took a hit. Um, a lot of those folks are not there. I mean, some of it has to do with some more agricultural issues in general. But you know, maybe it's something we can kind of look at through maybe the planning office or something else to see if there's a, a more coordinated uh, attack we can do, maybe partnering with some of those. I know the Chambers of Commerce, at least in the cities, also um, look into that. But maybe maybe that's a discussion for another time and we can look into that a little bit because I know the agricultural area has been has been hit pretty hard by this. So. Just a, just a thought. Maybe we'll throw that in the future. And I think there is starting to be an established with the farmer's market route for public transportation that's going to help them as well. All right, great. Um, okay, if no further discussion, I uh, look for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, any votes? Great, that one moves forward. Um, jump down to the next one, which I have here is hardwood transformations. Yeah, this is a business that used to be in uh, the Oswego area, and <coughs> they bought a uh, um, a vacant building in Williamstown, and like a lot of businesses, they suffered some significant uh, losses during the pandemic period. Uh, they demonstrated an amount far in excess of what they requested, and when we asked them about that, they're like, "Well, we didn't expect you know your program to cover everything that we ever lost. We're just trying to get a little bit of help from wherever there might be some available." and um, as you can see by the numbers and in the explanation there, uh, their, their, call, their request and our response to their harm in the pandemic uh, certainly is a reasonable amount. The committee uh, suggested that should be appropriate for your consideration. Okay. I'll do the promotion to discuss that. Do I have that? I'll make that motion. And thank you. I have a second. No, well, thank you. Um, so I mean, I guess it, you know it's encouraging to know that these folks believe that they, they don't need the full amount that they technically are eligible for. I I, you know, I, I understand, especially I know a little bit more about this project. I know that they uh, have been very negatively affected. If you can see the listing, the loss of income of almost seven hundred thousand um, dollars. So the only question I ask is this: It sounds like the task force believed this was enough to. It's what they're asking for. It's enough to kind of move the needle and, and get them back up on their feet, or at least help them. You'd hate to offer less than. 
they would need, but I'm assuming that that's a recommendation that's that was what was reviewed at the board. Okay. Austin, go ahead. I just want to add that the, the business uh, also has a few loans through the uh, through the IEA for equipment that was acquired back when when they were back in Oswego and, and and the equipment followed them. And the IEA had approved a uh, six month deferment on on those loans. So that that in combination of the two is is really what's helping the company. So I think that also helps them lessen the burden. They're they're still going to have to pay that back. Um, they're, we're just deferring it for six months. So that's going to help them. Um, so they aren't having to get the whole bite of the apple from the county. Great. Thanks, Austin. Good, good extra information. All right, so any other questions? No, again, I want to thank the task force for putting this work together. I mean, these are the type of projects, you know, trying to get businesses back up and running again. You know, the whole purpose of this emergency pandemic money was to help these businesses in a quick fashion. It's good to see that this money is going to do that. So appreciate the work that was done on this one. All right, uh, no further discussion. I'll look for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. Uh, next one is Mark's Automotive. Yeah, so... <clears throat> As you've heard uh, from today and previous discussions, the, the intent of the uh, ARPA funds was to help mitigate uh, the harm, economic and otherwise, that was caused by the pandemic. And uh, one of the ways that we do that with small businesses is to um, look at their financial records, or in some cases, um, they had a project that they were trying to do prior to the pandemic, the business world shut down. Nobody was out buying. Uh, you know, it, it just uh, impacts were were varied. Um, but in this case, uh, they had two two projects that they were trying to do prior to the pandemic, and then they put them on hold. Uh, one was to uh, put a new roof on, and, and the other was to um, get some new lifts. They they service a lot of uh, emergency uh, service vehicles. And uh, heavier type, it's it's. Um, I mean, they they do cars and, and residential or, or private trucks as well, but the bulk of their business is is in these bigger vehicles. So they needed some new lifts. Um, the cost difference between pre-pandemic and post-pandemic to do those two projects uh, came out to forty-eight thousand three hundred ninety-six, and the task force. Um, recommended or suggested 50% uh, of that like they do for some of the uh, small business uh, applications. So the number 24,188 represents 50% of the demonstrated harm that they suffered on these two projects. Okay. Uh, did I get a motion for this already? I got it. Roy, do you have a second? Paul, thank you. Yeah, the task force that typically has shown that um, they will help reimburse up to half of what was was lost or the increase in expenses or the loss in that <coughs> revenue. Um, you know, obviously there, there are some real small ones where, you know, it wouldn't make sense to knock $3,500 down to seventeen, right? So the thought would be it's a small one. And I think there's been a couple we've done it that way. Um, but generally speaking, Dave, you would say that the, the precedent has been or the practice has been 50% of losses. Is I think you described it properly. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other discussion with Marks? Um, and, and just to kind of make a quick point. Oh, go ahead, Ed. A general... Uh, discussion just to, to remind those that may have uh, forgotten there's a lot of um, research and calculation that goes on in Dave's office before these even get to the task force and um, he his office makes sure that they um, acquire the proof needed to show the losses or the loans or whatever. So um, an awful lot goes on to it. And then there's always the, the Clear Government website that everyone can get on to look at the scoring and the rating and the ranking. So it's, I, I just feel sometimes we're a little trivial because we can't get into that kind of detail. But um, between Dave's office and the ARPA task force, it's typically there's hours, just hours spent making sure these things qualify. That's all. Yeah, and it, I actually want to underline as well because there's a few projects that have, have um, qualified under, right? We talk about how they qualify. What is the, the piece of the legislation that they're qualified under? And one of these, specifically this one, is this idea that when you went, to, they were going to do a project before the pandemic, and then, you know, they got quotes, real quotes, and you can't just pretend, right? Quotes, and Dave's office verifies this. And then you weren't able to do it because of the pandemic, ultimately went to do it now, and the new quotes are 10, 20, 
$30,000 more expensive. And so what the practice has been has been fund up to half of that added expense that they now face. I mean, there's really almost no argu argument that that added expense was because of COVID, right? And that's mm -hmm. been the process, and I think it's been uh, very fair, fairly. Uh, just just to today's point, uh, they, uh, are these quotes coming from the same contractor? Um, when you went out for bid, you, 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 you try and get three. Yeah. Not every individual does, but you try and get three. And I mean, they can show you, oh, look, this guy charged me 50000 but I had one here in my pocket for twenty four. That was the low, but now I'm going to show you the high one. I'm just asking if any verification has done in that sense. For, for the most part, <clears throat> when um, when we ask for that verification, uh, we request that they, they go back to the same contractor or provider if it was or in the heart. But... Um, Sometimes uh, I can think of one occasion where the uh, contractor who, who gave him a quote before the pandemic went out of business during the pandemic, so they, they couldn't get a matching quote from him. So I, I guess, not the continuous, but did they show you any other quotes or just a quote from the contractor and a requote from the same contractor that they show you? Because most people will get two or three quotes. I mean. Contracting is funny, right? I mean, uh, depending on how busy a guy is, the price goes up, right? If I'm really busy, I'm going to hit you with a high price because I don't have the time to do the work. If I need the work, I'm going to hit you with a lower price, right? So did we look at any other bids that came in for these projects or just the ones that they submitted? Uh, we didn't look for any extra ones. Yeah, so um, specifically where we get more in the weeds with that is when they go to make um, the purchase or sign the contract. And then there's various thresholds in the federal language about what's required for procurement uh, based on dollar amounts. So 10,000 or less uh, in, in the federal procurement law is considered a small purchase. And you know um, they have to have at least a couple of different prices for that. Over 10, they have to have uh, you know, a public offering basically uh, uh, for procurement and at least three uh, quote. So that's really where uh, we get into <coughs> that level of scrutiny with them is when they actually go to make uh, the purchase of those things. Okay. Yeah, and typically, you know, obviously before the pandemic started, these are private businesses. They would have been governed by whatever their, you know, whatever their practice would be. I could see some of them saying, you know, I got a guy I've used before, give me an estimate, right? I mean, that's reasonable. Um, they, they would not have been forced to get three. I mean, I think if it was me or you, we would have, but it, it necessarily there's no requirement right. if not federal. So uh, I get, Ed, are you good, Mark? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ed, go ahead. yeah, I just wanted to comment that at this particular stage, uh, we're also applying the, the final rule whether or not they qualify, not necessarily to ensure that they're within any particular financial boundaries other than what we have set for limits that we'll hand out. So Dave explained it well that later on, depending on how this one is going to be, there could be more quotes needed. But I think it should be noted too that there's the scrutiny that we do at this level not only protects the county, but it protects the applicant as well because they're the ones that are going to be audited as well as the county down the road somewhere. So we're, we're actually playing uh, devil's advocate on both sides of the fence to make sure that somebody's not getting uh, something that they don't deserve or isn't warranted. That's a good point too, and, and I think um, the, the idea that that we are approving it. We have actually, I think, at the last meeting we talked about this a little bit too. Is that we don't we don't approve the contract today, right? All we're saying is they're eligible. We're moving on forward for the final yes, okay. <clears throat> then there's a whole contract process between the county and that applicant yeah. to hammer out the details. And in that contract, there could be clawback language. There could be requirements that that they have to fulfill. Um, there's been some we've looked at doing a, a disbursement over two years, and so. There are other pieces we got. That's not publicly done. That's that between the county and the applicant. Uh, but ultimately, they would need to sign that contract in order for us to disperse those funds. Okay. And that is, that is directly between Dave's office, between uh, Rich and the attorney's <coughs> office. And I don't know if purchasing comes in at all. They might would be there to advise if there was a yeah. requirement. Better, but. but back to your point about um, the procurement piece, it, it, as part of the first step, the application, there's a whole complete page about federal procurement and highlighted sections on there. So um, in the application, they have to sign that they understand everything that is in their application. They understand mm -hmm. what we've said. Uh, they uh, certify that what they've said is true and factual. There's a box that uh, they check that says, I understand that 
um, providing false information on a government document is a felony. So um, we we get it right in their face right at the beginning that there's rules and uh, your stiff penalties for not following them. All right, thank you. Good conversation. Um, any further discussion on this? <coughs> if not, all, all approve? Or all Aye. in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, moving forward to government courts. Uh, and I think we have one last. It's uh, Brian Manor, Dave? Yep. So uh, this was a straight uh, lost revenue uh, <laughs> review, and um, they had requested $35,000. Uh, we looked at uh, their tax returns, and there was an excess of uh, $50,000. So um, the task force looked at it and said, well, um, it could have changed their uh, application once you determined how much the loss really was, but they didn't. They said, no, 35 was good, and specifically, uh, that's going to help them um, fund some improvements in their uh, air filtration system for the facility to make it safer as well. So he said, really, it's 35 solves my problem. Okay. Um, so that's what the committee suggested. I look for a motion. So move. Thank you. Second? Paul, thank you. All right, any discussion about this one? It sounds like it actually qualifies kind of under both lost revenue and project related to COVID. So yeah, anybody do. doing HVAC, we, we've been looking to help out with HVAC. <coughs> so. All right, um, any discussion there? Good. If not, all approval? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Okay, great. I believe that is the last of our ARPA projects for this month. Uh, Dave, just as a quick update, we have... Are we looking to schedule, um, do you know, a, are there more applications that can be reviewed for the task force in the coming month? Or Yeah, we'll be uh, reviewing some uh, additional ones to, to hopefully bring a few to you every month uh, for consideration. And then um, you, at the top of your head, Dave, do you have any, just an estimate about how much money is left in kind of our public pot? Yeah, I do. Um, first, um, but back to your, your uh, previous question. So we have, uh, as of last week, 90 applications. Um, I know that's higher because we got two more just yesterday and another one that um, we're waiting to receive. Uh, of those 90, uh, so far 45, so we're about halfway through. Um, not all of the 90 uh, were eligible uh, and a couple have withdrawn. Um, but um, the Geographic disbursement is about 50-50 between the two cities and, and the towns. So 40, about 45 percent for towns, mm -hmm. and just over 50 percent for um, the two cities combined. Okay. Which seems reasonable when we realize we're looking at helping businesses. Where the business is, business. and not for profit headquarters are, and things like that. Right. So. Um, as of uh, last week, that doesn't include the ones that are that are being reviewed uh, this month. Um, six about six million five hundred thousand has been awarded, so there's still around you know four or so in the pot. Cool. All right, excellent. Thank you, Dave. All right, any other questions for Dave or the ARPA process or any of these? If not, we'll we'll move on to the next portion here. Thank you, Dave. Um, Look at to do some department updates. Dave, you mind? I'm going to jump to uh, the other folks, and I'll come back to you at the end for an update. Um, is that right? Okay. Hand. Okay. Uh, Joe, why don't you kick us off with soil and water? Come on up here, sir. Um, last year, uh, we had. I don't know if I've seen you guys since early early December. Uh, we had. Uh, a great, great 2020. To uh, we did have as far as our this report on some of the main main highlights, and then uh, move on to kind of our plans for the year. Um, so our technical assist, I think that's a that's a big one, and kind of a um, you know a main main reason for some of the, the extra support that committee gave us in, in 2022. Uh, we we assisted around uh, 400 individuals last year, just in our water quality general technical assistance. Um, our uh, uh, some of the um, uh, forestry assistance AEM program, and that's a that's a pretty big number. And I'd say in the last you know seven years, that's that's essentially double. Um, and that could be you know quick conversation all the way to planning uh, you know entire plan, maybe even a construction project. 
um, you know, assisting towns, municipalities, agriculture, forest owners, all the way to you know, urban and suburban landowners and then rural landowners. So um, that's a that's a big number for us. I think in the past I've reported that with a couple other things added, our ag value assistance uh, pro, or ag value program, as well as our um, giant hogweed assistance, and so that gets you around uh, about around the 500 or more number, which is uh, a pretty big number of individuals that we've we've had interaction with and, and some of those assists are, as I said can take honestly weeks to, to get through a permitting aspect of that or something of that sort. Uh, a few of those that we finished up in the last part of the year were some management plan development for forest landowners. Uh, we assisted with development or, or updates on about 450 acres worth of forest land. Um, some of the two of those were, were brand new. One was an update and what that entails is I was going out taking some measurements on the land spend uh, usually a day, maybe a couple of days out there uh, visiting various points throughout the landscape or out the, the forest of property, uh, certain measurements looking at tree composition, density, and we compile all this data, mapping, uh, an entire environmental review, looking at historical photos all the way back to the 30s, and we can tell the history of that landscape. We can tell what, you know, what has occurred and why are we looking at what we're seeing. Uh, and that, that sort of thing, and then what's the best course of action to manage that. So some of these individuals are pretty motivated and they are interested in federal funding, so we assist with that. And one individual, we've taken the route of actually putting in an application, took several meetings with federal folks out in the woods, and uh, taking a look at some, uh, some various um, you know, uh, programs that they could enter into, some practices they'd be eligible for. And uh, one individual did submit an application over a six-year period. Uh, they're looking at you know maybe maybe ten to fifteen thousand a year to do certain um, certain things that will improve not only the forest health but also um, wildlife habitat. So that was a big uh, if if that goes through that's kind of a big big win. Um, this was a really you know, large property in the Williamstown area. Um, so that was the last part of the year. Uh, the beginning part of the year we jump right into planning. Uh, we do have a lot of reporting that's due to the state uh, just to prove how did we use last year's um, you know, uh, funds and that sort of thing. So that, that does take up a lot of time, but we've jumped right into assisting folks planning for our you know, agricultural projects. There should be three going on the ground this year, invasive species uh, very similar to last year, and uh, for, you know, forest management product projects, forest plant uh, management planning. We do have um, a couple new things there this year. We'll actually, we should be constructing. We've assisted with the design over the last couple of years and um, that sort of thing, um, a bridge at the Deer Creek Marsh area uh, that'll take the DEC with equipment over the dunes area and onto the beach for maintenance. Uh, we have one we're working with the Friends of Great Bear and then a research project up at Silver Lake. Um, beyond that, several of the, you know, working with snowmobile clubs for design of a bridge and culvert, uh, working with a town for design um, of, a, of a culvert up at Casog Lake. And so quite a few, quite a few projects going. One thing we're going to add this year is what's called uh, uh, culvert assessment. We will be entering some data into a state, essentially um, visiting as many culverts in the county as we possibly can. Obviously, this is a multi-year effort. And what that does is we're looking at uh, some state standards, trying to get these culverts where you can have fish passage. Um, a lot of these, if you really get down and look at them, you'll have, um, if you ever notice, a culvert and the water drops about this far. Obviously, if there's no fish passage for, um, especially the northeast part of our county for native brook trout and things of that nature. So um, these, um, these assessments can, in the future, uh, relate to funding. So that's where we may, you know, uh, may work with uh, with the state on some of these um, you know, various funding opportunities and hopefully get some funding. These are you know, proactive, long-term approaches, but hopefully we're able to work with various municipalities to get some of these things off the ground. Uh, but the first step is the assessment. So we'll start with, um, we're actually starting with, and this is kind of a to jump into the, the last topic, is that we're starting with the Sandy Creek watershed this year, um, as that is one of the, um, if, if anyone has gotten some emails on what's called a nine element watershed plan uh, meeting, if, I don't know if folks have seen those come around, I think a few have gone out to some of the legislators in this committee and, and um, the rest of the legislature as well, as their uh, a watershed, watershed plan is, uh, or watershed in itself is essentially um, it's, it's based on topography, it's based on, it, it really it ignores any political boundaries. 
um, any municipal boundaries. It's really based on topography and where these waters um, shed to, in a sense. Okay, so if you take uh, you know the the Oneida Lake watershed, that's all the waters to the honestly in, in a um, several county region uh, that end up flowing to that that lake. Some of the major tributaries, they also have tributaries or even unnamed drainages. Um, that's where you get kind of a uh, of a squiggly line and that's your, that's your watershed and a lot of it's based on topography and <clears throat> staying all of that all that water sheds into this one water body or this one area and so we're working with uh, Jefferson County Soil and Water Conservation District and um, uh, some other agencies Tug Hill Commission working with the DEC on uh, the Sandy Creeks watershed and we just held a, a public meeting for that in mid-January we have a couple other meetings Nine element plan uh, is essentially a watershed plan, but what the, this is a DC proof to plan. They have to go through a pretty rigorous um, uh, quality <laughs> assurance planning process with the DC. The process itself is approved, and then you get into the plan. You collect water quality data that's modeled, and then essentially what it does is, is um, it provides you with some best management practices that should be done. It can be it's not just one group that's focused on. Um, it's, you know, there's agricultural best management practices, forestry best management, um, all the way through it could, could deal with septics or just large scale, you know, um, installation of, of uh, you know, sewage treatment, water treatment, all kinds of different projects that can come out of this. And in the end, obviously the benefit is, um, you know, potential, like, you know, large, larger scale funding. Um, it's obviously, it's an advantage when they see something as part of a comprehensive plan. So. Uh, we are working, um, you know, working on that. Uh, we, we're not necessarily taking that, taking the lead, but we do have some involvement in the planning committee for the Sandy Creeks watershed. Um, also on the uh, the planning committee or stakeholder committee for the United Lake watershed as well. So when you see these emails come along, that's uh, that's what those are about. It's nothing regulated either. So these are anything recommended is completely voluntary. Uh, what it is is to avoid any regulatory. You know, uh, you know, push from from the state and down the road. So it is a uh, it's a benefit to the county, and it's a little bit of a long term, more proactive approach. And hopefully, in the future, it does gain us some funding and uh, various projects. And uh, that's it. Anybody have any questions? That's great, Joe. Uh, yeah, as, as always, I want to thank you for all the hard work you and your office do. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. the hardest working groups we have for as many staff as you have. So thank you again. I, Constantly, I'm hearing from my constituents how much they appreciate their interactions with you in your office. So, so thank you. <coughs> I'm you for that. Thank you. Um, Ed, really? Arm Russell, to see who goes first. Or? <laughs> no, I was just pointing to Ed because oh, okay. you weren't paying attention to it. I know. Uh, sorry. Ed. <coughs> I attended the the Tokyo Water Center. It was very well attended. It was about There's about 50, 50 people. It had to have been yeah. 50 people there, anyways. Uh, and because uh, that watershed affects. The ponds north and south, the city ponds, and we know the, the uh, how crowded the, the sewage systems are there. And there's an, the next phase of this is coming up pretty shortly, right? The next meetings. Yes. Um, so there's uh, today is actually the focus group meetings, and then there's a final public meeting in mid February, and that's um, virtual, and it's just a, really just the, the summary of what came, what concerns uh, came yeah. out of it, and things of that nature. Um, the other thing I was wondering is. Uh, will you be involved with the work that's going to be done at Camp Survey? Uh, as far as trail, like trail extension, yeah. Um, yeah. So we have I had some communications with um, with Zach and, and Brian from the Youth Bureau, and so we have a meeting set up in a couple <clears throat> weeks. We've just done a, a preliminary environmental review of the you know there are wetlands there, endangered species, things like that to work around, and so there will wherever they put something there's likely to be permitting, and will definitely. So you uh, you're uh, running the Sandy Creek one. You're I mean, um, isn't the one that uh, on Oneida Lake uh, uh, like it, headed up by the Regional Planning Development? Yeah, Board? yeah, exactly. Central Area Regional Planning um, is is heading that one up. They've assembled a um, uh, like a, a you know a planning group or a stakeholder group. So we just you know offered some information as needed as far as the Sandy Creek one. Um, 
we I would say the lead is you know is Jefferson County, but we definitely have some some info. We're on the committee uh, on the planning committee, and then we will we're uh, we've offered to have you know one individual help with the, the uh, sampling as well. So we do have you know we do intend to have as much involvement as possible with that, and even some of the the funding. They are expensive, pretty expensive plans, so we will contribute as much as we're able to. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I will mention uh, from the Human Services Committee meeting yesterday, there's some discussion in, about a uh, an ARPA project actually that will internal that will help to fund a frisbee golf course out at one of our parks. And so I'm very excited about it. I know actually through this committee we talked about it a while back. Uh, the the idea of a need for um, tourism related uh, parks uh, expansion. And so I'm excited about this. Uh, so keep an eye out for that, folks. If you're at all interested in frisbee golf or froth. As a, those of us in the know call it, um, but again, I'm very excited about that. It'll be in probably the next couple months, I think. And so I, I do know, in talking with both Ryan and Zach, that uh, they very much appreciated the help from uh, Soil Water. Um, we talked a little bit about the need, I think, for a little more expansion into our Parks and Recs idea of what the county offers here. So something to kind of keep in mind too down the road. Uh, Roy, um, since we're we're on this. Uh, the, uh, he has a project that he's been working on with hum through uh, Human Services having to do with Parks and Rec at the Independence uh, Trail site, um, having to do with what, what is the, the critter that we're trying to abate. So uh, Hemlock Woolly Adelgia, it, it really, it, it's, it was found in 2020 or 2021, and we started a project of pesticide control at Independence Park and, um, and um, Camp, Camp Palace as well. That, that it's a you know very very small you know um, uh, insect and what that does is if you look up from now until probably April if you look at a hemlock tree if, if you have it it'll have this, these little white cottony masses in them um, that's the adult and essentially in about a decade that causes a decline in mortality of that tree so Independence Park has I think a, around a thousand hemlock trees alone so with a trail network through it that would be um, just an extraordinary cost to get those, you know, if they did, did die, that would be either you'd have to close that area or, you know, remove them, which would be... So the reason I'm bringing it up is that um, the, uh, environment, is it the environment, Environmental Management Committee, we're looking for a review of that from them, and right now they're defunct, so I just maybe put it on the record that we need to ask that uh, Betsy, you know, how we, uh, whether it's a chairman's pick or you know, this committee has to choose uh, a chairman for that to get that committee uh, to take a look at this so we can bring it back. To yeah, I think and, that's just oh, sorry, go ahead, and that, that request was for um, the, the Hemlock Initiative, which is a New York State organization part of Cornell University. They approached us about releasing a predatory, mm -hmm. predatory insects there. And this work has actually, it has been done already, as of last fall, was done in Mexico State Park by New York State Parks and um, Parks and Rec, I think. Um, they, uh, so they already, re you know, released some, and that was being asked of us because we're like the leading edge of the, of the infestation moving gotcha. probably around the lake, sure. Yeah, I wasn't sure I was actually going to ask you if, if maybe Paul and his oh, Well, so I gave myself a note, but I always don't follow okay. through with everything. So if I get it on the record, I thought... No, it's good. Yeah. And, and we've talked a little bit more about kind of a, as a county-wide over um, reevaluation of the, all the standing committees, the appointing committees. And yes. So it makes sense to have that on the, on the record. So it is. Thank you, Roy. Thank you. All right. Um, any other discussion? Was it the WASP? Um, this one, so the, the wasp has been released for um, emerald ash borer, and that we were involved in that at Rice Creek. Yeah, Rice Creek. These are beetles and a silver, oh, it's called a silver fly. They get them from various locations. Most of them are U.S. There is one that, and that's kind of what the one that catch, catches the attention is one that's uh, um, from, from Asia. Um, but I think, I understand that that one is very unlikely to be what's very expensive. Um, you know, very, very limited. That one's very unlikely to be um, okay. delivered here. So it would be probably a beetle, and it's just, it, they're very specific, so they're not made to, to cause any ecological, um, you know, uh, impacts otherwise. Uh, if they are, they're, you know, extremely minimal, but they're also, they're also permitted by USDA, that's too. So they, they do have to go through a rigorous yeah. um, <laughs> process for that. Great. Well, Joe, thanks again for being our bug guy. We appreciate that. <laughs> no problem. All right. Uh, any other questions for Joe? All right.
Thank you so much, Joe. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, uh, Gary, you want to step up to the table here, and we'll kick off a little bit of discussion with uh, again. Thank uh, Chair of the IDA, uh, Gary Tolk, for joining us, and uh, Austin. Again, welcome. This is, I believe, your first meeting with us as uh, your new position and title. So, it is. Yeah. Uh, uh, introduce, uh, introduce the. <laughs> we really should the the new CEO of the IDA and the new Executive Director of Operations of the County, Austin Wheelock. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I know I've been here before, but uh, in a little bit different role. So, um, a little more excited to be here in the new role and be able to uh, get, let you guys know the good things that are going on. So. Um, one thing I did want to uh, make you guys aware of is that, uh, and this is something Mike usually did right around the beginning of the year, um, the Swingle County projects that have received state funding through both the CFA and Restore New York and DRI and New York Forward, all these kind of programs, they, they um, in the past, they've sort of all wound down near the end of the year. Well, the last couple of years, the CFA has been sort of a, they keep going until they run out of uh, money funds. And so... Um, I want to give you guys an update of where we are so far, and we're calling it 2022 because they're going to backdate some of this to 2022 projects. So, uh, uh, so far, um, actually one of them was just added to the list yesterday, um, so they're still doing this as they go. Uh, 13 projects in Oswego County have received state funding from CFA as well as New York Main Street, Restore New York, um, and uh, the OPRHP, which is Parks, Recreation, Historic Places, Environmental Protection Fund. So. Uh, those 13 projects uh, is uh, $50.57 million of investment, uh, total investment, and those 13 projects have received uh, $7.91 million in state funding. Um, just to give you a little background on, on that, so of those 13 projects, eight of them are for-profit businesses, five of them are municipalities and not-for-profits. Seven of those 13 are Empire State Development Grants and Excelsior tax credits. Three are Restore New York. Um, one is an LWRP project in the town of Granby. Uh, the New York Main Street project is in the village of Pulaski. And the Environmental Protection Fund project is in the city of Oswego. So uh, it's a five Oswego projects total, three in Scruple uh, in Phoenix, two in Pulaski, one in Fulton, one in Granby, and then one that's a countywide project. Um, I say that this is to date because there are still four more potential projects that are in the CFA hopper as well as waiting to hear about um, some of the DRI and your forward finalists that haven't been announced. And there has also been, um, just last Thursday, another um, Swigo County project that was submitted for Restore New York. They did two rounds of Restore New York this year. Um, in the first round, the uh, Market House uh, 1836 Brewing was one of the funded. There was a uh, Pulaski project around uh, multiple buildings um, on the river as a, a revitalization project and then one at the uh, former Kmart um, in the city of Fulton with a manufacturer looking to occupy the majority of the space, and then some of it EMI and some other uses. So so uh, there's a lot of cool stuff going on. Um, this has actually been a pretty, especially on the Restore New York, so there were eight projects funded in the region. Uh, so we'll kind of get three of those. So usually we're, you know, on, on something like that, we're gonna get one, maybe two. Uh, we got three, and, and the other, Four counties had the other five projects, so that was that was pretty exciting to see um, uh, good representation from Oswego County there. Um, you know, a couple other highlight projects: the uh, Dell Drop Manufacturing and the Industrial Park in, in Phoenix uh, was awarded 1.25 million dollars for their their uh, relocation and expansion to Oswego County. Um, they're the one I told you about in the past, the Clean Room Manufacturing Company. Uh, Austin, real quick yep. on that one. Is that sure. is that the project where they they came in and actually purchased a portion of? Yes, they purchased land like um, in the existing industrial park from Operation of <laughs> County. That actually that deal just um, closed at the end of la uh, end of twenty twenty two. So we're involved in that and with multiple kind of hats in multiple ways. You know, we're we're providing the land that improved land uh, to them to have a spot to locate, and we're also helping them to get incentives at both the state level and and, and local level. And if I could, the, the reason why I think that's so important is a lot of times uh, we talk a little bit, or historically we've talked about this idea of the IDA doing incubator space, and right? And so, you know, the IDA, they're not taxable. And so there's been some criticism in the past of, of taking properties, giving or selling them to the IDA, Aberystwyth County, and now they come off the taxes. And so what I really want to highlight here is that this is exactly the purpose that, that they serve, is they're able to go in, they're able to take those properties, they're able to develop them, 
and find a buyer and then get them back on the rolls at a much higher rate than they would have been in vacant space. So I just really mm -hmm. want to highlight that uh, this is this is a win. This is exactly what we're hoping to see with these incubator spaces. So, yep. so um, Austin, oh, one second. Second. Yep. is it the first uh, business plan to go, go into? So the this is park? still in the existing park. This isn't in the new area. The new oh, area still <clears> needs <throat> to have infrastructure brought in, but that we're going to look to develop that in the same exact way. You know, we're probably we're going to start at the beginning of it and kind of move through. Um, we're looking potentially to have um, some larger anchor businesses, maybe take up a larger chunk at the back of that. Um, but yeah, that's we're we're still in the uh, we're, we're actually applying for funding through Fed New York uh, to try to get some uh, funding through New York State to really uh, fill the gap for the infrastructure related to that project. Maybe you'd share with us how much property is still to be developed at our existing. The existing industrial park, um, it depends on if you're counting property that is wetland or not, but there's probably somewhere around 20 acres of, of actual usable uh, of acreage now in the park uh, after that. I mean, there's there's a 40-acre spot that's probably 90% wetlands. It was, it was a spot that was originally being looked at by DEC to put a training facility because it was perfect. It had wetlands and everything in there for them, but for, for most people, it's probably not going to fit their needs. So. So there is, uh, and then there's also a 40-acre um, lot that I don't consider part of the industrial park that's on 57 that was acquired to give us secondary access to the industrial park. So so it's it's acreage that we have. It's not improved like the industrial park is, um, but potentially could be utilized for that same purpose. So, And then there's 185 acres that's in the new land that was recently purchased by the IDA, and that's where we need to bring um, infrastructure into. And that actually leads into... Um, good transition to the next. So the Village of Phoenix wastewater treatment and conveyance was uh, awarded seven hundred fifty thousand um, through through ESD um, earlier uh, in in twenty twenty two. So there's some other projects. Uh, like I said, there's the Town of Granby uh, local waterfront revitalization plan. They were awarded funding for um, waterfront along the river as well as uh, Lake Neotawanta. Uh, this is the one that was just announced yesterday on January 30th. Uh, Northland Filter in the city of Oswego was awarded 250000 towards an automation project that they have going on here in the city. They're, that's a building that we actually we sold to them. We The IDA and OOC had built that back in uh, 2002. We had had a long-term long tenant for the entire time. Back in 2018, we sold that building to that company to, to expand, and, and then this is part of their expansion project to, to add more jobs and do some automation. So it all kind of connects into each other at one point. Uh, another smaller one down. This is another one down in the industrial park in Phoenix. R and D Design and Associates. That's a, a really cool project. They're doing uh, 3D printing of, of metals. Um, they're a plastic injection molding and prototyping business down there, and they've grown into uh, now doing some 3D printing. And then they're also made, they're also making their own 3D printers to to sell. So that's part of this project. So it's a so that's cool one down there. Are they 3D printing them or no? I don't think they're 3D printing them. <laughs> yeah, it's like some 3D inception there. <laughs> but uh, no, so I mean, there's some there's some strong projects. And then like I said, we're still waiting on a few to hear about that were submitted um, late in 2022. Um, and they typically take anywhere from 9 to 12 weeks to work their way through the state system to if they're awarded or not. So, um, and then like I said, the... There was a Restore New York project just submitted last week for the uh, former Bex Hotel in the Village of Mexico that, that we're hopeful about because it's a, it's a really good project and to see that finally come to fruition and be redeveloped would be great. So so that's uh, I wanted to really give you guys a heads up on that. It's not completely finished because we're still waiting to hear about a few projects. and. Um, there may, if they don't use all the funding on this last round, they may do another um, round. Um, it's been sort of floated out there, potentially uh, due March 31st, if they find that they still have more funding left over from, from 2022. So uh, when that is uh, confirmed, I'll make sure to let you know, and then we can get the word out because uh, it's, there's money out there, and a lot of people don't know because in the past the CFA was a one it was a one time thing. You could apply for it in July, and if you didn't get it, better luck next year. And they they become more picky about the projects that they fund, uh, and they just said, well, you know, we funded 20 percent of the project or 20 percent of our funding. We're just going to keep doing rounds until we run out. So I, we're hopeful that they'll do another round, and, and any projects that may have come around since then or may have been um, re, re, recalculated or refigured, we can resubmit. 
and see if we can get them. Um, you know, it's one of the things is that, that yes, they can resubmit if they've already been denied, and then they give them ideas. Is some, that right? They tell them programs. why they were denied. Uh, we try to find that out on their behalf. Sometimes, okay. sometimes they don't. Um, it, it depends. So the way that these work is that they, the ones that go through the CFA process, and not all projects go through the CFA process. For store in New York, they go directly to New York State, and sometimes we just don't know how the sausage is made when it goes to the state, and they don't. And, and those are ones they don't tell you you can resubmit. If you don't get it, they're kind of telling you, well, you didn't get it for a reason, we don't want you to resubmit. Okay. Um, for the CFA ones, though, they go to the regional council for the initial um, scoring. And so if a project doesn't get a 20 um, to the regional council, um, a 15 or 20, it's, it's probably not going to get funded by the state. You know, they, they put a lot of weight on how that is funded at the regional council level, but I've seen it where a project will get a perfect score at the regional council and then it doesn't get funded by the state. So, you know, they break their own rules all the time, And but the best way to, to potentially get funded is to make sure your, your project scores well there. And so that's where we kind of have a little bit better idea of what what was good about it, what wasn't, is, is how things were done at the, at the regional council. Um, we do try to get um, input from our Empire State Development uh, representatives, Jim Fail and Dan Kolinsky, about why a project may not have been funded uh, at the state level. Uh, sometimes it comes down to maybe they'd already gotten state funding and they didn't want to double dip on a project or, or they... You know, this at the state level, they, they have certain priorities this year, or, or they're comparing it to other projects, and, and they, they say, well, we're only going to fund one of those types of projects in the region, and, and unfortunately, it was this one, not yours. So it's it's not always, it's not in a vacuum. It's sort of, you know, um, there's some other factors at play. But, you know, I, I was looking through a list of projects that were not awarded, and it's a pretty small list. I mean, there's, uh, some projects got cut down quite a bit from what they had asked for, but uh, I, was, I was pretty happy to see that like I said, of that 13, there was a much smaller list of projects not awarded. And so I think we're getting better at doing this over time. Um, another question is, I know it has to be at least five years that I've heard one project over and over again. And mm -hmm. the money has come in. We've got awards, awards. And again, Phoenix Wastewater. Mm -hmm. Where are we? I mean, after so long, when will we actually have sure. shovels in the ground is the help this out. I would defer that to Dave. He has a better yeah, understanding like of that. Yeah, um, your timing's good. I just met with the town or the village board um, last week to go over that. <clears throat> the um, part of the complication is, like we've talked about with some of the ARPA projects, increased costs. So in 2021, 20, when we uh, made applications to all the various agencies, uh, that was about just under $8 million. In 2022, when we reapplied to some of the uh, entities that <clears throat> we didn't get funded from in, in the previous years, um, the, pro the project had gone up to about 10.2, so $2.2 million. So our, our, the goal line keeps moving, um, and that's part of the complication here, and, and that's Part of the conversation I had with, with the village board is like, we need to get this done. And right now, <laughs> as it sits, you've got a pretty sweet deal because um, we've been working on getting all the funding line, lined up for them. And their contribution is like six cents on a dollar right now. Mm -hmm. said, um, if, if this doesn't get funded soon. It's just going to keep costing more and more. Mm -hmm. And we're going to lose more and more business opportunities. So um, my charge to the village board was, you guys really need to think about um, taking the next step and what level of financial uh, assistance can you bring to this? Because if, if we can get them to bond for like three million dollars, two and a half million dollars. They're still getting a very good deal on the project, um, and the project will, will get done. We have um, Environmental Facilities Corporation. Uh, we we're looking to them for around three million. Um, last year, they we we um, the village to do. A bond resolution costs you a lot of money. You have to bring a special bond council on. You have to do all the public notices and all, all these uh, processes. 
And, you know, this was a lot of money for the village to take on for, at that time, like just over a million dollars is what the shortfall was and they, they might have had to borrow. So if you do like cost benefit analysis of do we want to spend this much money to prepare to borrow a million or chip or so when we're not really sure because of all the applications we had out, uh, if they all were funded, we didn't need the million. Um, but because they weren't secured, when uh, the Environmental Facilities Corporation looked at it, they said, well, you've identified it, you've applied for this money over here, but it's not secured. So what's going to happen if they say no, where does that other million dollars come from? And so the language in the uh, board resolution was that um, should there be a shortfall, the village is prepared to uh, go forward uh, through borrowing. Well, that wasn't specific enough for environmental facilities. They said, well, I really need to say that, you know, you've identified, you're, you're going to do this, and you've had bond council involved, and you're ready to go pull the trigger on bonding if your money doesn't come through. So on that technicality, um, EFC didn't fund it. So we're working now with EFC, the lawyer uh, for the village, and trying to put something together that they're both comfortable with so that we can reapply to environmental facilities again this year. And there's also a, a federal grant, uh, Northern Border Regional Commission, that um, we had in the mix for a million dollars, which is their cap on infrastructure. And uh, that wasn't funded last year. And the reason that they gave us, uh, we haven't had a, a full uh, review of the application, with, but we requested it many times. Um, if, if that one gets funded this time around, last year they just said, oh, we had too many applications and, and um, we couldn't serve everybody. All right, well, when I looked at uh, the criteria for uh, awarding the funds, one of the met metrics was how much money does our grant leverage? And they look for a minimum of three to one. So if they're going to give you a million, they want to see that that helps you get another three someplace. Um, our proposal to them last year was a seven to one leverage. So far beyond everybody else who applied. Uh, and then some of the ones who were awarded didn't even meet the three to one. So I've been trying to get the Department of State to tell us what really happened here. Um, and um, they've been very reluctant to do that. So we'll apply to that source again this year, even if they don't get back to us, you know, we'll throw that money. Uh, that application together, but we're hoping that the costs didn't increase tremendously from last year's to, to this year's. But I know that from June, when, when we put the application in, it was like 1.2 million. Uh, in December, when we uh, were looking at, okay, let's get ready for next year, it was now 1.7. So six months went up half a million dollars. The main complication is that, you know, we're trying to get to the end zone but to keep moving it. You know, <clears throat> I just don't know how long we can go without losing the money that we've already got guaranteed. And it seems like, once again, and that there is no chance of them even starting this year. It, because you're saying you're, you're going to submit applications yeah. for these other two grants, so. Well, uh, the, the other option is, and that's just what I said to the town uh, village board, I said, even if we do put both of those applications in, and even if they're both funded, we're a year and a half down, down the road before you can hire somebody to do the construction drawings. And then you're a year out before you actually get somebody with a shovel in the ground. Yeah. So, you know, this really needs to get done and you guys need to decide how badly you want it done. Um, so the other plan B uh, is Village borrows the rest of the money, and you just go forward. Right, and they would uh, borrow it through a bond. And you said that there is a, quite a bit of an expense with doing a bond. Yeah. Is there any way that the county can help with the expense for the bond, and then they do it? 
I mean, I'm just saying looking for a little yeah. carrot for them to, okay, look at, we're willing to help you with the expenses of a bond, but right. you have to bond for all that money. So we have a million dollars committed already to the project. So that, that would be, you know, something for the legislature to decide whether they want to go above or beyond that. Uh, we've already dedicated to this project. I'm just trying to think. Yeah. I'm trying to get this thing going to get them to do it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And we... Austin and I uh, have talked about several other paths to try to get some uh, funds, um, but again, they, they take time. Yeah, and I do understand, I mean, if you're asking the village to put up that kind of money, and I know they're looking at how much of a benefit is it to actually the village versus right. how much of a benefit it is to the county and even the town because it's mainly for the industrial park. There'll be some residential, but it's mainly the industrial park will, you know, be advantageous to them. Am I correct in saying that? Uh, um, yeah, those are correct statements, but the, the advantage to them is like right now, because uh, during wet weather occasions, they're maxed out. Yeah. So even if they want to add a residential property to the system, they have to demonstrate to the DEC that someplace they've offset twice what the impact of that one house will be. Okay. So if they're going to be, uh, you know, 100 gallons uh, a week, someplace they have to show where they reduced the current uh, flow by 200 gallons a week. Gotcha. So, I mean, definitely so, yeah, there, is a advantage. Advantage. there is advantage to yes. them. And I think that's the thing that we have to push is that you guys are dead in the water of any more businesses yeah. or residential to the village if you don't do this. So it's worth your investment. Yeah. And specifically, we talked about, you know, um, what do you want the village to look like? You, you're you in Catbird Sea right now, Mike runs yeah. seven miles away from right. you. There's tremendous opportunity for you. You need to uh, figure out what you want Phoenix to be and how you want Phoenix to look and really start making some big decisions about wastewater, main streets, um, neighborhood improvements and things like that because they, they could they could come out real winners uh, if they yeah. do it right. Yeah. Is the industrial park in the village limits? No. See, that's it. It isn't. It's in the town. Yeah. And I know the town has invested money in it, and the county's invested money, and IDAs, and everybody's been putting money in it. And I, I, I'm just trying to be the devil's advocate as to what is their <coughs> paying up. And I could think it could be that they're like looking at how much are we actually, and we need to prove to them what an a, a, advantageous it is for them to put this bond in. Right. Yeah. But. Oh, yeah. Okay. Do they sound committed, Dave? Yeah, I talked to a uh, village administrator the following day, and he said, "Yeah, we're 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 ready to really think hard about taking the next step." Thanks, uh, Roy. Uh, so it seems to me that the surface water infiltration should be something that should be kind of addressed before you're even trying to expand. I mean, if you're saying that the wet weather is providing all kinds of problems. That means that they're not mitigating people having their sump pumps on the system. Well, so whether uh, people have sumps on there or it's just uh, a bad stormwater collection system, um, they have they have an old system. Uh, the the part of the conveyance system that this project will address is specifically the line that uh, is part of the scruple sewer district that is uh, treated by the village. So a line that goes from the industrial park to the treatment plant, we'll uh, scope that, see if there's any infiltration there, repair bad manholes and things like that. Uh, but that's only a small part of the whole collection system. Um, the way that, so it's very expensive and, and time consuming to uh, put cameras down all your lines, figure out where your leaks are, uh, then make those repairs. So uh, a second way to do that is to create like a holding pond or tank process. So what we're going to do is add a couple of really uh, big tanks. So in wet weather, they can hold all that uh, surface uh, water. And then as you get 
uh, less demand on the treatment plant, you start feeding that in over a period of time instead of a big rush, which causes the overflow into the river. So well, we can't. So you're addressing it already. We're addressing it. I don't but, know if that's the greatest solution. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's the quickest and most cost effective. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, Schuylkill is um, doing a feasibility study to determine whether they should have their own treatment plant. Because really, uh, if there's <clears> going to be significant growth in the town and the village, um, the village plant will soon be overwhelmed, even with these improvements. Mm. So um, one of the things that uh, the town has talked about is uh, depending on where their uh, plan is located and where their main conveyance lines are, that perhaps they could take some of the load off of the existing uh, conveyance system in the village and feed it over into their new plant. And so how much would that be? They're looking at that in, in their feasibility study if we were going to do this. Because the town wants to see the village grow as well. So a couple of different paths going on. It puts a little more pressure on the village, too, that if they don't do anything, the town could step in and do it. Yeah. Great. Uh, Gary? Yeah, I just wanted to add what Dave was saying. And, uh, in Syracuse, um, quite a few years back, there was a court decree on upgrading their sewage facilities and systems. And they did the exact same thing. We built like two, and I think they have a third <coughs> enormous holding tank to do exactly what Dave was talking about. Take, you know, the storm water, hold it until, you know, the, uh, the treatment plant can take it in and put it in the lake so it doesn't get all merged in and everything. So is it the best solution? But you got to look at also redoing all the conveyance systems, everything versus if a fix can happen immediately, it's like a holding tank. So, I think it's I think it's a good solution. It's a good start until we get enough funding to upgrade all the the conveyance systems and all the lines, manholes, and everything, which would be enormous. But this is a really good example of why um, we're also trying to determine whether it would make more sense for the county to be in the wastewater business. Um, it's not an uncommon scenario where uh, a town or a village has a, a treatment system and they just can't afford to uh, make it grow or even sometimes keep up to the code. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll see what comes from that. Uh, we've had people say, oh, that's a really great idea. I said, well, okay, um, appreciate that you like it, but I need the people in charge of the village to uh, tell me that's a really great idea. Yeah, actually, I, if I, I, this is a great conversation. I appreciate all the everybody at the table talking about it. One of the things we've been talking about for a couple of years, I know it came out of Dave's office, but also the IDA has been um, encouraging it as well, is this idea of looking at is there an authority that would make some sense to, to handle this, right? Uh, you've got a lot of people who are really good at focusing on their areas, um, but we as a county, our tasks and uh, strategic initiatives specifically, and the IDA as well as a county-wide, uh, is tasked with looking at what makes sense larger scale, longer term. And so uh, it's a conversation that's ongoing. Uh, Dave's office had, uh, did help put together a, a grant application for funds to study. What do we do next? How do we get this going? And I know we're working on trying to get that um, uh, responded to take over and, and to help us uh, that, put that together. Uh, but it is something that we, I, mean, I think we all understand we need it. And if we're going to have any sort of the expansion that we expect to have, especially the southern portion of our county, uh, these these discussions are going to have to have, and they're going to have to be figured out. So I appreciate everyone being at the table and part of that. Um, but. Yeah, and I don't know, Gary, um, Austin and I and uh, Tim had been discussing this recently, and, and uh, the thought that uh, for a former uh, county administrator uh, had a lot of experience in this in his uh, later part of his career when he managed the uh, Development Authority of the North Country, and uh, Gary, on uh, our behalf, reached out to um, Senator Wright to say, hey, uh, would you mind just chatting with us a little bit about some of the things you did up there and processes? And, um, so we're, it's ongoing at various levels trying to keep this moving forward. Um, one question. It it, it doesn't really have to do with that, but it is a question about it. <laughs> um, I know that CNS sent us all letters about the brownfield. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I underst 
I always thought brownfield was only land that was contaminated by hazardous waste to be developed. And then somebody said, no, actually it's expanded to just underdeveloped areas. Is that true? So there's a couple ways that brownfields are defined. Uh, and the most concise is any piece of land that is known to be or presumed to be somehow impacted by some type of pollutant over the years. Okay. So it is it is still tied with hazardous waste or pollution of some type. Okay. I just thought I was I'm just shooting spitballs. No, it's good. Gee, if it's underdeveloped, why don't we use that money? You know, but okay. Yeah. And it's a good reminder too. I, I think most legislators received um, a mailing encouraging them, reminding them if there's any areas in your district that this could apply to. Uh, they're still looking to put that list together. Uh, reach out to Karen uh, at Planning if uh, you have somebody. So, um, all right, great conversation here. Appreciate everyone. Um, any other conversation specifically? That I, I just wanted to add one thing in terms of. Uh, I know this had happened late last year, but just wanted to thank the legislature for reinstating the. Uh, the portion of the pilot funds to the IEA. Um, this is going to help us to be able to do a lot of these things that we're talking about. I mean, that's that's where that kind of funding comes from. So to be able to, uh, I'm not saying that we have that there's enough, but uh, it's a start, and I think that uh, we're very appreciative that the county saw the value of that and reinstated those funds. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Um, any other discussion? Any questions for Austin or Gary? pursue account of the IDA side. Pat, just as a reminder, the CFA <coughs> replying, uh, mentioning is the consolidated funding application. It is the uh, chief way that the state has set up the access to their funds. So if you've got a project uh, or a business that you know of or an area that needs to be developed, uh, that usually opens in July or June and July, it closes in July, and then the funds will be awarded usually uh, in the December of this year for work in 2024. So start to think if there's anybody that you know of or any businesses in your area that could use up to some of these could get up to 20 percent of their project covered by the state um, if they're outside of the, uh, the city limits uh, i would reach out to austin and, and operation sewer county they will help uh, write those applications to the state uh, where we're available so uh, reach out and they'll also let them know you know what grants make sense and, and what funds to go after so keep that in mind yep studies up to 20 or studies could be up to 50 percent of the project cost and like bricks and mortar money is up to 20 percent okay so again, that'd be for June, July area usually. Some of that rolls a bit, but in general, June, July. All right, Mark, go ahead. Just real quick, uh, Rich walked in as a reminder, IDA members have to sign uh, some sort of card. Betsy has those oath, oath cards. Okay. 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 Um, sorry, there's you. a certificate. Sure, okay. yeah. <clears throat> yeah. All right, great. Um, so I appreciate, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. And I think we're jumping over then to uh, Dan, if you want to give us an update on community development on this, anything you want to recommend from planning for the last? And it's been a little bit, I think, since we've asked you to update, so feel free to go as deep as you want. Uh, I'm going to go with tourism on this one. Okay, sounds good. Uh, we have the tourism website narrowed down to three. Uh, we had 14 or 16 responses. Last week we had three 45-minute uh, to an hour and a half virtual meetings uh, with the three finalists. Uh, we're hoping my next EDP meeting will have a finalist for you. Uh, we're just checking up on references. Uh, Wednesday, April 19th to Friday, April 21st is New York State Tourism Conference. We've met with uh, Bob Grujos, who's uh, coming up to do that. Uh, everyone gets into town Tuesday. Tuesday and Wednesday, they're on their own. We're working with the Fort as well as the Safe Haven Museum and the Richardson Bates Museum uh, to be open during that time. We're hoping Tuesday and Wednesday to get them into the downtown area, working with Aquaspa, working with the downtown business, and hoping to do like, a 15, 20% off they mentioned. Um, so the three things they're going to be uh, talking about this year are the marine sanctuary, sustainability, and workforce development is what they're geared towards for the three days of the uh, And that's here in Oswego this year. That is is that it always conference. here or is this done? No, last year we're, we're in like a, uh, just like a jump spot because last year was in New York City and next year it's in Niagara Falls. Okay. So it's like they're just moving up the upstate. Well, it's exciting that we're able to host that. Here yes. Very how many people, you have an estimate of how many people will be here for that? Yeah. Somewhere between 150 and 200. That's exciting. The only problem is it's in April and it's a coin flip. Yeah. We, yeah. We're hoping that they were in like May or June where the weather is, nice you know, much better. That's exciting. Um, we we'll probably work with any of the uh, outskirts, towns, villages, any events out there that would make sense that mm -hmm. maybe we could highlight those uh, for people who are already kind of locked into a studio county. It might be the only time they ever get here. It might be kind of cool to share some of that. So. 
Sure. All right. Um, anything else, Tim? Yeah, one more thing. The uh, New York uh, Sports and Expo was at the State Fair this past weekend. <clears throat> Excuse me. We had a uh, booth there. Uh, the only thing I took from from the day I was there is a lot of people asking for ATV maps. We have snowmobile, we have hiking trails, et cetera. We have no ATV sort of working with that club. That was the main question that I got asked a lot. Do you have an ATV map? We do not. So something we will be working on. Yeah, because ATVs aren't allowed on the snowmobile trails, are they? Correct. But we do have an ATV club. If you go to the website, there is they give you some information, but there is no real map. So yeah. that's something we're going to be working on. So, uh, Dan and I talked a little bit about this the other day and, and the big difference between ATVs and snowmobiles. Snowmobiles um, get state funding to help uh, maintain their trails and the expenses to, to, uh, to do that, build bridges or, or whatever, buy new groomers. They do that because a portion of the snowmobile registration goes into a fund and that fund gets distributed across all the uh, and areas where uh, there's organized uh, snowmobiling. So the ATVs don't have any resources like that. All of their funding is from memberships into their clubs and fundraisers, chicken barbecues, whatever, poker runs. Um, so they kind of feel like they have an ownership stake in the trails and like publishing a map, you know, like, Here's our trail system. Anybody you want to come in and ride around, they can't really police it and control it the way that they can if it's membership only. Um, so it's, you know, we have a good system of trails, uh, but it's not generally known uh, to the public or even accessible in some areas to the public. So if we wanted to make that better, there's something that should come to the table and talk about mm -hmm. you. If you need more money, we need the public to be involved. We we can't help you if it's only going to be members only. But potentially, we could we, we could look into maybe using as our as our uh, tourism dollars are growing from bed tax revenue every year. Potentially, maybe we, we look at using some of those funds to do maybe a little more coordinated attack at how do we how do we market this? How do we you know really start to use this drive tourism in that area? Maybe some additional funds for those folks. There's, yeah, there's uh, places with a uh, high level of organized trail system and, and um, Brock and I happened to be driving uh, north on 81 one day uh, last fall and just uh, after you go under Arsenal Street, um, there's a couple of hotels right there on the edge of 81. Parking lots are full of trucks <coughs> and trailers with ATVs and more mud on them than I had ever hoped to get on my truck over its life. Um, but uh, looks like they all had fun and there was a bunch of people in Watertown because they had been at an organized event on a public system. Great. Uh, Roy? So, uh, you know, the snowmobile clubs can actually uh, have, st have stickers that they charge for, for specific trail sections as well. So do you know if that money goes directly to the to the club or does that go? So not in Oswego County, in uh, Old Forge. Right. Their trail system is um, managed in a way that you have to pay to use it. Why is that different? Uh, that's just the way that they set it up over there. I don't know if it's because the town has some trails up there. Yeah, the, town, the town actually okay. owns and maintains uh, a lot of the trails. Okay, all right. So they do the maintenance as opposed to the club. Yeah, in some cases. In that yeah. situation. Okay, because uh, so a couple of things now that the uh, Assembly and Senate uh, are in session, are we, you know, going to be able to try to press for our Airbnb, you know, bed tax and for maybe for uh, ATV clubs to be funded to allow for us to be able to, you know, I mean, that's a big deal now. Um, they can set it up just the way they set the snowmobiles up. Right? I mean, maybe we need to get together with uh, you know some other areas that have you know those sorts of trail systems, and say, hey, this needs to be codified in you know state law for us to be able to do this and fund these clubs. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if there is any official ATV trails in the southern part of the county. It's all up north, is that? Yeah. Well, there's a small system on the east or the west side of the river that is um, 
pulls into Fairhaven area and Sterling, um, and then comes in like lo around Hannibal and, and a little bit in Granby down uh, the edge of Route 3, but it's very limited. Yeah, see, so we got the old railroad beds that go right through Scruple and up until Central Square and beyond. All the way to Cleveland. All the way to Cleveland. And I know <clears throat> not supposed to have um, ATVs on it. And I'm just like, that needs to be addressed somehow because there's more and more people with ATV. If, unless you truck your ATV up north, you're, you have no place to run it because you're not supposed to have them on the road, not supposed to have them on the railroad bed. So where are people going to do them? Right. So that's what I'm saying. We're not making it very accessible and saying you can't do this, you can't do that. you got to go up north. Yeah, they are allowed on the section from Toad Harbor to Cleveland. Um, several years ago... Uh, there was a request because of the concentration of users over there and some other activities. Legislature authorized uh, that section to be open to ATVs. Okay. Because there's more and the more. The bigger problem is is people, you know, driving pickup trucks and cars uh, down the down the railroad uh, bed and <clears throat> throwing couches and other things. You know, it, it's. Yeah. No, they the ATVs, they, they right. up the trail a little bit, but private citizens uh, who aren't very well being uh, I think that that's a conversation we, I yeah. know since I've been on this board, we've talked about it a number of times, and maybe that is something maybe as we start to um, move forward in that area, especially with the, the tourism driving, we can look into that a little bit too. So to, to Roy's point, I do want to mention that that is a conversation we've had as well, the, the uh, bed tax discussion. Now we have okay. we have two new state senators, um, and my understanding is that the chairman is uh, will be sitting down, not just in future with with either both of them or or individually. Um, and that is a conversation that was had with the previous state senator. Um, it would need to be brought back up to the table. It needs to be go through state law and would need to be carried by uh, those representatives. So um, the conversation is still ongoing. And obviously, now that they're back in session, we did find out it was not done at the previous one or was not moved forward with the previous center. So the hope would be that that conversation will be had and my understanding of this. So. Is there anything we can do to push it? I think it's on the it? chairman right yeah, now. Yeah, I believe it's a discussion. Okay. I'm just going back to the ATV trails, I just want to point out the obvious, just in case somebody isn't aware of it, the difference between snowmobile trails and ATV trails are that snowmobiles leave little imprint on people's property. Right. So if you have a farm or you have land that most people don't mind a snowmobile going across, they might not be so likely to accept ATVs rutting up their property and like rutting up their farm crops you know, in the summer times. All right, that sounds good. And I know Joe, if I could, Joe, I know has been active as well um, with so on water and helping out in the past with some of our trail work and trail maps and things like that. And discussion about how that what that could look like down the road. So obviously we can bring Joe in as well as we kind of move forward. But it might not be a bad idea um, to look into what, what that could look like. And actually, it, moving over, Dan, is there anything else before I kick it to David? Thank you, Dan. Anything, any questions for Dan before uh, directly with tourism or planning or anything like that? Okay, so I want to move it over to Dave and strategic initiatives. But specifically, I want to highlight the fact that we, we talk to Dave a lot and obviously the work that Kyle does uh, with him um, on behalf of the ARPA projects, but strategic initiatives was, although set up and funded currently by ARPA, is a much more needed and much larger um, scope than just specifically tourism and planning. And so my, my hope would be, as we have these conversations about wastewater, you know, if Dave had not been taking that on himself to, to take on, it's not necessarily part of the responsibilities of the planning, although you could make that argument, but strategic initiatives, I think it is. And so I want to, again, encourage folks as we start to look at the bigger picture of what we need in this county and how do we put together these towns and villages and interactions with people who don't necessarily always interact with each other, conversations like long-term tourism uh, drivers and you know, trail systems that cross municipalities, we need to have a centralized office to handle that. And so again, I want to highlight the work that Dave's been doing. I thank him for that. And, you know, as this board starts to think about it more, um, I would encourage you to, to, you know, as ARPA will only be here for hopefully a little bit longer and that money will be spent, and there'll be some um, ongoing uh, reporting required, but the, the need for that office, I think, is the piece that this board, I think, would, uh, would I hope, would, would see the value in. So. Um, I say all that only to say, Dave, is there any updates that you have outside of maybe ARPA specifically for strategic initiatives? I know we just discussed the wastewater conversation here and the authority. We talked a little bit as well, but is there anything else that you want to highlight that you folks have been working on? Oh, so not my retirement date. I'm trying to get what you're asking for here, Jim. I'm not hearing a single word you just said in that, so. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, there's uh, lots. I mean, broadband, uh, Kyle uh, is fully engaged with every single broadband webinar or meeting uh, that we can have, so we try to stay up to date with um, what's going to be available to us. Uh, we just completed the um, challenge uh, that the FCC uh, put out. They provided uh, nationwide maps based on the data that they had from all the service providers and they identified addresses as being served or under or not served <laughs> um, and it was by various levels so you could look up um, any service at all that might be usable at this address and I can go to your house or your house and um, focus on that and it'll tell me yeah, they can get uh, satellite service. Um, they they can get um, coax cable service, or they can get telephone line quality service, and what the speed might be associated with those services. But um, the feds have set a new higher threshold. It used to be um, twenty five megabytes download, three megabytes per second upload. Um, which doesn't really provide you with what you need uh, for your kids to do. You cannot watch oh, Netflix with 25 now, so. <laughs> yeah. Or I already here. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, now it's uh, 100 down and um, uh, 20 up. And when, when you put that new threshold in and then you say, show me if there's service here, and you narrow it down, you can say, well, I want to see only fiber, or I want to see all wired, no, no wireless. Um, all of a sudden, those addresses that used to say they had service, all of a sudden say that they don't. Um, and you would think that, as an example, with everything that happens around the city of Oswego, we've got the university out there, we've got power plants out there. But if you say, show me the city of Oswego, and show me every address that has fiber service, there's almost none. So things that we like take for granted that, oh, we've got the city, the port, the college, the nuclear plants, what else? <clears throat> almost no fiber to any business or residential address. So our, our goal is to try to get fiber to as many as we can because it's uh, the most um, flexible and the most uh, sustainable over a longer period of time, but it's also expensive. Uh, but, uh, so anyways, in the challenge, uh, we found around 700 addresses that the FC FCC used to say uh, were served and we provided them with the information to say they're really not and here's why. And so why is it important? Because um, within the next uh, month, the states will start to learn from the feds how much money that they're going to get so that they can distribute to other communities. And a lot of that is based on those maps and the number of people unserved raises the level of money that can come right to your state and eventually to your community. So. Uh, that was a big project that we did with the help of the Central New York Regional Planning and Development Board and some from Tug Hill Commission earlier who helped us get some service uh, information. So yeah, we're, there's a lot of stuff going on besides just reviewing our applications. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Eddie, go ahead. So regarding the broadband, um, where are you and how is it going to cooperation with the other communities with their uh, funding piece of this for their ARPA money? So we had a few, uh, at one point we said uh, the county would dedicate a specific uh, percentage of our ARPA funds and we invited communities to say we'd like to help and, and if you put up 20% we'll put up 10%. Um, a few officially said yeah we'll do that, if you guys are going to do that we'll do that. Um, we haven't, uh, I haven't come to you and said, okay, I need a piece of paper that says you're dedicating X amount of dollars. Um, and one of the reasons is we, ha we have a, a provider 
um, who I've been talking to for uh, about six months now, who said, uh, I have investment uh, firms who are looking at my projects, and I think that I can finance this whole thing uh, by, you know, a private business offering, and what my plan is to come in and, and get fiber to every address in the county. And I need your help to um, give me letters of support, talk to the state when we get ready to make those applications, meet with our investment team, um, but I don't need your money, as far as I know right now. So we haven't really taken the step to say, okay, give us towns and villages, give us your money, we're gonna put our money over here. Uh, leave that where it is until I find out where this guy's going. And um, part of the wait was to see what the challenge looked like when we sent that back. Because uh, now we know that there's a higher level of funding that might become available. And so instead of us applying for those funds uh, from the state, this developer would apply for those funds. And David, th that's the, the same account. developer who we've already partnered with or worked with to do the current um, fiber loop that the county is served by, right? That's part of the advantage uh, is that they already own this asset that's like the middle mile, they would call it in broadband speak, right? So you have the, your main like trunk line and then you have a distribution system that you get it like our 60 mile loop mm -hmm. uh, and then you build off from that and that build off to all those other residential and down every road and street. That's the last mile, right? getting to the door of the business. The, the downside, obviously, being that we as a county wouldn't own it, right? The private company for profit would own that, which would, you know, that's their asset, similar to the way it is already. I mean, you've got Time Warner who owns their Spectrum Oaks infrastructure. It's not r ridiculous, but it wouldn't be county owned. I think it's important. Some folks have, have believed it would be county owned. Uh, Rich, go ahead. Yeah, I would just note that the initial um, proposal to build out the county's fiber loop included, you know, half of the Paired, uh, half of the fiber going to the county, the other half being used for private and municipal economic development. The extent that that's not reflected in active fiber now, it's a good question to that vendor, why? Because the county uh, financed quite a bit. Other counties have formed local development corporations and build out fiber on their own. Another model could be just solicit proposals instead of waiting for a private company and see who comes to the table the problem is that there would be no competitive opportunity for someone to rebuild on the work that's already been done. The fact that it's a 60-mile trunk loop already out there, there's no one who could touch it. I mean, to redo that would be millions well, of dollars. Other, so, other counties have built built out uh, right. with, you know, they formed these local development corporations sure. and built out on their own. Onondaga uh, uh, partnered with Verizon to provide uh, several towns uh, guaranteed uh, internet at Yep. Certainly. Uh, it's, a, it's a possibility. I just there's other there's other miles as well. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, yeah. that's good point. So uh, that's uh, a good point because uh, one of the things I said to to this developer is, uh, you know, having fiber to every address in the county is huge, and that's certainly a, 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 an ambitious goal and one that we would support. But um, access is only part of the question. Affordability is the second part. So if we were going to work with you to try to make this project happen, there's got to be some guarantees that you're going to let at least, you know, three, four, five, six other providers use your system right. to offer service so that our residents and businesses have a choice because with choice comes uh, affordability. Yep, that's a good point. So uh, more coming with that, obviously, but I think you can kind of see that that has not fallen off the table. Obviously, we're, we're still staying on top of that, and the hope would be that we're not too far from at least starting to work on the solution. So, um, Any other questions for Dave, strategic initiatives, or any other directors here? If, if not, uh, I did just, and I apologize for being on the phone a little bit there. I, I realize that the agenda did not show that we do have to make a couple uh, recommendations for appointment to the Transportation Board. Uh, the chairman does appoint, but we need to recommend. So um, I'm going to, if I could, look for a motion um, to uh, number one, I don't know if we need a motion for this, but uh, first I want to accept the resignation of the current chair of our Transportation Advisory Committee, uh, Mary Ellen. I want to thank you for all of the hard work that you put into it and the service that you have 
uh, provided. Uh, thank you. I know you've done a lot of work to, to move that ball forward, so we really appreciate you. So I'm going I'm I'm to do that. Oh, yes. so, um, so we, we have accepted that resignation, so there is uh, there is a vacancy um, as well as an additional vacancy. So I'm going to um, make, I will make the motion to recommend the names of uh, Legislator Roy Rehill and Legislator Jay Scanlon to the Transportation Advisory Board. Um, and I'll second it. I have a second. Thank you so much. Um, any any discussion on that? There is, like I said, the vacancies available. Uh, both those individuals have indicated they are willing to serve, and I want to thank them for that. Uh, and again, the chairman will uh, officially appoint, but we need to make a recommendation at this board. All right. Any other discussion? If not? Uh, abstain. All right. Roy will abstain. <laughs> thank you for not storming out of the room. All right. Yes, I, didn't, I, I will not accept <laughs> <laughs> or. All right. So um, if no discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And one abstention. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. I'll look for the appropriate motion. I'll make that. Okay, motion to adjourn. Second. Paul, thank you all in favor? All right. All right thank you, everyone.